Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today we have Paolo Celli from the Department of Civil Engineering at, of the Stony Brook University in the US, who is giving a talk here. He's an assistant professor there. And prior to joining uh, Stony Brook in January 2020, so quite recently, he was a postdoc at Caltech. And there he worked in the lab of Chiara Darayo and collaborated extensively with NASA's uh, JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Materials Development and Manufacturing Group. So he's trained as a mechanical engineer and he did his studies in Italy where he, and he obtained a PhD in civil engineering from the University of Minnesota in 2017. And Paolo's research interests are in solid mechanics, um, dynamics and vibrations and smart structures. So he uses a combination of experiments and numerical methods to to develop structural systems with innovative properties and reconfigurable attributes and to understand their mechanics. So today he's going to talk to us about pattern from going from pattern sheets to functional morphing structures. Paolo, please go. Okay, thank you so much, Manas, for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for attending and uh, thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it, especially under the circumstances. So before I start, I just would like very briefly uh, to tell you uh, about my university, about Stony Brook University. So we are actually located, for those of you that don't know Stony Brook, we're actually located in the Northeast United States. So we are uh, up here in the state of New York. And in particular, we're not too far away from New York City. So we're actually located in Long Island, which is this large island to the east of New York. So if you ever happen to be in the area, if you ever happen to be in New York, um, please let me know and pay as a visit. Okay, so in this presentation, I would like to show you some of the recent work that I've been doing, that we have been doing, in the context of morphing structures. And in particular, looking at the title, you can see that the word functional is up there. And it's up there only to try to signify, at least my desire, our desire, to try to move from proof of concept mechanics to um, some ideas that can potentially be more applicable in a uh, structural context. Okay, so let me begin with a brief introduction on shape morphing structures. So some people call them shape morphing structures, shape changing structures, foldable structures, deployable structures. They are slightly different from each other, but they all boil down to the same idea. These are structures that are designed to undergo predictable shape changes in response to external forces. And usually, at least historically, they feature multiple uh, jointed elements that are connected together. So examples are uh, everywhere around us. And for example, uh, here you can see there can be everyday objects like foldable chairs or these foldable toys, like the famous Oberman toys. Uh, they can be used for medical devices, for example, to create some deployable stents or drug delivering capsules, like the ones you see over here, which are pretty recent. And they're also applied in the context of earth and space structures. For example, they've been used to create shape-shifting facades for building, for energy efficiency, and they've also been used in the context of space application, to, for example, to create deployable antennas that can uh, then be used for climate monitoring. So this field is actually already quite developed, but yet in, few, in recent years, there has been a push in slightly new research directions. For example, people have started to look into reducing the part count of these usually complex mechanical systems by resorting to compliant hinges, so continua instead of jointed parts. And uh, in order to do that, people have uh, explored the new um, ways to achieve shape changes, for example, by means of origami and kirigami systems. And I will tell you more the, about the systems later. Um, at the same time, people have looked into obtaining more extreme shape changes, for example, extreme area changes or transforming structures from flat to three dimensional. And finally, uh, people have also started to look into non-mechanical actuation. So trying to obtain the deployment via non-mechanical forces. And for example, uh, via thermal stimuli, um, humidity stimuli, uh, voltage, or magnetic fields. Okay, so in this presentation, what I will do, I want to touch upon these topics. And in particular, I will try to take you on a journey through the work that, I've, that we have been doing, that I started at Caltech, and I'm continuing now at Stony Brook in the context of shape morphing structures. And everything started with a curiosity-driven question, so when Basile was at Caltech with us. So what we wanted to do is to find a strategy for 2D to 3D shape transformation that was simple, or at least simpler than the strategies that were out there at the time in the literature. 
And then we tried, we took a bunch of steps in order to bridge the gap between this idea that uh, however was bound to work only at the tabletop scale and uh, uh, some, some potentially functional and load bearing structures. So along the way, I will show you um, how we can, for example, change these architectures in order to create structures that are made out of structurally relevant materials, for example, metals. I will talk briefly about our progress in non-mechanical deployment, for example, using temperature triggered shape morphing. And finally, I will uh, make a few notes about upscaling this initial strategy. Okay, so let me start with this curiosity-driven question. So what we wanted to do, again, is to create a strategy for 2D to 3D shape morphing, so transforming a flat sheet into a 3D surface that was geared towards simplicity, okay, so that was simple. Um, and in particular, uh, the, the, our motivation was that most of the strategies, for example, origami and the systems, um, they um, are quite complicated to fold and to morph into complex shapes. Uh, therefore, and that, that can limit their applicability and scalability. Our system presented the following key elements. First of all, we use single layer sheets and we use laser cutting in order to imprint a certain cut pattern. Our cut patterns are non-periodic, and at the time we were among the first that tried to actually use non-periodicity in these metamaterial systems. And finally, we used inside loads applied a few boundary points in order to trigger the actuation. Our starting point is the sheet that you see over here and that I have here in my hands. So this is a uh, rubber sheet, uh, two millimeters thick, uh, that presents a pattern uh, that was invented by Grima in 2005. So basically, you can see that upon laser cutting, in this detail, we have these bulky tiles that you see over here, these squares, that are connected by these thin, flexible hinges. Um, and just to give an idea of scale, uh, one of these squares is six millimeters in uh, size. So now, this system can be treated, can be analyzed through a pin-jointed analog. So we can create a pin-jointed analog to the system, and then we can investigate what are the mechanisms of an extension of deformation. So what are the modes of deformation of the systems, if there are any, that require zero energy to be active. So it turns out that since this system is kinematically indeterminate, we do have a mechanism of an extension of deformation that you see over here, which is characterized by the rotation of these tiles about the hinges. So up until now, everything is kinematics, okay? There is no mechanics. But now, if you want to look at the mechanics, what we did was to perform experiments and numerical simulations on this sheet. Uh, and what we did was to plot stress versus stretch. You can see that there are two regimes of deformation. So there is a first regime that you see over here that it's a um, low steepness regime. And then there is a second one after more or less 1.3 stretch that is much stiffer than the other. So just to give an idea, this curves. The uh, continuous ones are experiments and the dashed one is a numerical simulation. And since the sheet is isotropic, the response is identical along both directions. So now looking at these uh, uh, deformed images, we can see that in this low energy um, uh, deformation region, we have that the system behaves like a mechanism. And you can see it because you see the tiles rotate just like they would do in the uh, kinematic analog. Now, if you track these lines, so the red line, lines are designed to connect the joints along the horizontal direction and the blue line connects the joints along the vertical direction. So these lines are initially zigzag, but when we pull on the sheet, we make them more and more straight because the tiles rotate and align with each other. So at one point, if you keep pulling, it happens that these lines are already completely straightened out. So if you keep pulling after that point, you excite the elasticity of the system rather than the kinematic mode. And that's why you have a second region that is much steeper with respect to what we can do is to actually generalize this cut pattern. So, okay, we start from a uh, design grid that you see in orange up here. What we do is to replace the slits that we had in the previous slide with these diamond-shaped cuts that you see over here, okay? And with just a few parameters, we are able to, so which is the width and the height of one of these uh, diamonds, we're able to create periodic sheets with completely different mechanical behavior. So we, this is one of the, uh, powerful things about these architected systems, which really with few parameters, you can obtain something completely different. And in particular, what you see over here are three geometries that we decided to test to see what is their uh, mechanical performance. So here on the right, what you can observe is a uh, stress 
stretch plot. So basically, no, actually no. What is this? This one is a stretch stretch plot. So we apply a stretch, we take a sheet, we apply a stretch along the horizontal direction, and we measure what is the stretch along the vertical direction. And the dots correspond to experiments, while the continuous lines correspond to kinematic models. What you can see is that uh, the sheet, so the structure A, has a negative Poisson ratio. And you can see that because the stretch is greater than one along the horizontal direction and greater than one along the tangential direction. The, on the other hand, the pattern in B presents a positive Poisson ratio, and you can see that both B and A have really large deformations. On the other hand, the geometry in C. So if we look at it, if we look at this pattern, you can see that these lines connected the joints are already straight before uh, pulling, and therefore there is really no mechanism. And for that reason, this geometry in C is much stiffer than the other two. So what we can do is to actually create some design maps where um, basically we can, uh, if we, based on a certain stretch that we desire, certain mechanical behavior that we desire, we can backtrack what is the uh, cut pattern needed in order to obtain it. Now, up until now, everything is periodic, but we asked ourselves, what happens when you introduce non-periodicities in the systems? So this is an example of a non-periodic sheet that you see over here. And if we do the matrix analysis, so the truss analysis of these systems, we will see, we, you can see uh, pretty quickly that there are no mechanisms. And the reason for that is because uh, due to non-periodicity, you have kinematic incompatibility. So if you take a region as a standalone element, then it might have a mechanism. But since you're putting it together, to, you're putting it next to a region that doesn't have the same mechanism, these two mechanisms impede each other. And in the end, you have no... Um, kinematic motion. However, if we apply the forces, uh, this will cause geometric frustration. So a certain region wants to behave in a certain way and other regions want to behave in a different way. We wanted to try to understand how this frustration resolves into a deformation. And in order to do that, what we did was to consider a, a non-periodic cut pattern, so the simplest one that we can think of. So the one that you see over here is identical Everything is identical along the horizontal direction, while there is a gradient of properties along the vertical direction. And in particular, the central region is designed to be much softer with respect to the top and bottom, okay? So what we do at this point is uh, uh, to, basically we apply forces, horizontal forces, at the midpoints of the vertical boundaries, so the points that I'm highlighting right now. We place, we put, uh, we pull on the sheet, and what happens is that the central region wants to expand, but it can't expand in plane because it's constrained by the top and bottom region. And because of that, there would be an outer plane buckling of the sheet, and we will obtain the following three-dimensional shape that you see over here on the right. So there are a couple of cool things about this three-dimensional shape. First of all, the, this phenomenon, this, this buckling phenomenon is a global buckling phenomenon meaning that it's not constrained, or at least we don't think it's constrained, by the size of one of the tiles. And moreover, we are able to obtain a surface with non-zero Gaussian curvature, like you can see over here, which is something that is not typically easy to achieve with these systems. We try to push this idea a bit further and try to see also what other geometries, what other patterns we could obtain. So we're still in a forward design framework. For example, here you see a sheet where there are two auxetic islands that are surrounded by regions that are much stiffer. When you pull on this sheet with this pattern of forces, those two regions pop out of plane. In particular, we replaced the right part of the structure with this um, uh, finite element simulation. So this is, an in, this is just an in-plane finite element simulation, and we are just tracking the compressive stresses. And what you can see is that there is a concentration of compressive stresses in uh, the region that buckles out of plane. We tried more complicated cut patterns, like the one that you see down here. Um, this one is interesting because basically we can see that from the same geometry, if you apply two different load patterns, you can obtain completely different surfaces, like you can see over here. So this makes everything a bit tricky because this is not simply a geometrical problem. There is not a one-to-one -one transformation between this initial sheet and the three-dimensional surface. Um, right now, we're in the process of actually trying to create some computationally inexpensive model, for example, a reduced order model or equivalent continua, in order to be able to um, um, 
model accurately and efficiently these uh, uh, morphing mechanisms. Also, eventually, we would like to do some inverse design of this shape. So, prescribe a 3D shape and backtrack on the CAT pattern needs to be. We also tried like more complicated CAT patterns. In this case, you can see a sea like aphthetic region surrounded by stiffer regions. Now, if you pull on the sheet at certain points, what you can obtain is a localization of inputs along the sea like path, as you can see over here. Okay, so um, we, we found ourselves with this, ourselves with this uh, we thought it was nice, at least with this nice uh, idea uh, in our hands, and we tried to, uh, we asked ourselves the question, so can we actually make these structures out of metal or out of a stiff material? So the reason for this is because our project was funded by a collaboration with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and the interest was to uh, use space-relevant materials. So the first thing that we tried in uh, shifting towards stiffer materials was to slightly change the design. For example, what we did, as you can see here on the left, is changing the scat patterns, uh, introducing an additional length scale, which is the length of the hinge. So we tried to make the hinges way more compliant, so that when they would bend, they wouldn't undergo plastic deformation if they were made of a stiff material. Um, it turns out that they still under, under, underwent plastic deformation. And here on the right, you see um, what you can obtain if you fully leverage this plasticity. So we start, we start from this fat plastic sheet. What we do is to manually form it. So this is not boundary excitation, okay? So this is just manual forming. We expand it locally and we are able to obtain this complex uh, three-dimensional uh, curves um, that then keep their shape due to the fact that the, these uh, hinges are deformed plastically by hand. Um, but we, we didn't want these plastic materials, we wanted something out of metal, and there is not much out there in the literature regarding these shape morphing structures made out of metal. Uh, some examples that I found interesting are metal origami that have been published recently, or metallic glass kirigami. Anyways, so the first thing that we tried to do was to take an aluminum sheet and just imprint our cat pattern on it. We thought that was the easiest thing to do. However, uh, we tried to apply forces at the boundary to see if we could deploy this uh, uh, metal sheet, but things didn't work out, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, and this is because essentially once you start pulling on the sheet, you have that certain regions uh, under plastic deformation. So there is a nucleation of plastic deformation in certain regions. And if you keep pulling, you're not really propagating your deformation. It just concentrates on these already damaged regions. So this strategy didn't quite work out. So we went back to the drawing board and we tried to think, okay, but what do we need? So what are the fundamental mechanics in our system? If you look at one of these deployed rubber sheets, what you can see is that basically there is an alternation of region with thin hinges that can bend in plane followed by regions, this, uh, uh, this, this uh, how did I call them? These tiles that can bend out of plane, okay? So you really have an alternation of in-plane bending and out of plane bending and so on throughout the structure. So our, what we asked ourselves is that, is there a way to create a structural element that presents this alternation of regions that bend about tangential planes? Uh, we didn't have an answer, uh, but we found one, um, which is a bit uh, cumbersome, however, and then we try to explain to you how this works. So the idea is to take a ribbon. So a ribbon is a structural element in which the length is much larger than the width, and it's much larger than the width. We take the ribbon, what we do is to apply a twist. And this is what happens if we apply a twist to a straight ribbon. Uh, this is the, uh, basically it transforms into an helicoidal shape, uh, but if you look at it from the X3 direction, so from the, um, this X3 direction, so look at this shape, you can see that looking from the top, there are certain necks, so there are certain regions that can potentially bend about this X3 axis. Well, if you look, that, and there are also, that alternate with regions that can bend about X2, okay? So it's not perfect because it's a pure helicoid, but it's a start. So potentially in a twisted ribbon, there can be uh, per perpendicular or alternating uh, directions of bend. Our idea was to take twisted ribbons, first of all, fabricate them, and then put them together to create more complex structures. And I will show you how we managed to do something like that. However, there are problems with ribbons. So for those of you that have studied ribbons, uh, especially the twisting mechanics of them, 
um, you know that basically they have lots of instability uh, atoms. So the reason for that is that if you take a ribbon and you twist it, what happens is that you're going to have, for example, if you look at the axial stresses, you will have tensile stresses at the boundaries, and at the center of the ribbon, you can have compressive stresses. So these compressive stresses can actually cause buckling particles. Moreover, due to Poisson's effect, you also have a shrinkage along the uh, tangential direction, so the lateral direction, and you can have also axial, uh, so you can also have lateral compression and more buckling modes. So actually all these buckling modes for ribbons, for twisted ribbons, were categorized by Chopin uh, in the 20, in a 2013 paper that is just beautiful, where they show all these different buckling patterns obtainable with twisted ribbons. In our case, we don't want buckling. Uh, we don't want it because we want a ribbon to be as smooth as possible, to be so that the regions can function as perfect hinges. And in order to do that, the first fix was to apply a pre-stretch in order to eliminate the axial compression. And the second was to introduce a mesoscale, so this boundary undulation, that allows to better localize the deformation along the regions that we want. And I will show you later what are the benefits of this in terms of stresses. The other question was, how do we fabricate a twisted ribbon that is actually uh, frozen in its twisted shape? Okay. So that's not an easy feat. Uh, the first thing that we tried was to uh, just create, basically use a plastically deforming metal and manually form it in order to have an alternation of regions that are flat in one plane and regions that are flat in a different plane. This didn't go very far, as you can imagine. We tried to think about using composites, um, but we didn't find the proper solution. Um, so in the end, we decided to use both metallic glass. Um, so both metallic glass, what are they? They are amorphous metals that uh, have a quite, I wouldn't say extreme, so I should correct this. It's a quite uh, um, uh, uh, large elastic limit, okay? So you will see later, it basically can be, um, um, the elastic limit is 2% strain, which is much larger than common plastically deforming metals. Moreover, it's thermoplastically formable, and this is a very important property. So basically, you can take a, a, um, a certain both metallic glass structure, you can deform it, you can heat it up above the glass transition temperature, quench it, and it will be frozen in that deformed shape, okay, without pre-stress. So that's the beauty of both metallic glasses. So our, our strategy is the following. So we start from trying to design ribbons and understanding their twisting mechanics through numerics, experiments, and analytics. So in the interest of time today, I won't be talking about analytics, but we have an archive paper out, uh, if you're interested, where you can see details about the analytical model. Uh, we also did, uh, then we, we, we move on to thermoforming the ribbons and finally assembling them into structures and testing their shape morphing capacity. So this is one of the undulated ribbons that we use throughout our work. Um, basically, these gray tabs are the tabs that, are, that we use to um, basically clamp the ribbons uh, and to do tests. So the length of the ribbon is L. Uh, there is a wavelength of the undulation, which is lambda as an amplitude A of the undulation. And basically, uh, we have uh, the width is a function that oscillates uh, and the maximum is W, okay? So W is the maximum width. Um, perfect. And then another important parameter is this theta T. What is that? That's the target angle that we want to apply to this ribbon. What is the target angle? It's the angle that allows, after you twist, to obtain basically that all these thin neck regions are aligned with each other and parallel to each other and perpendicular to all these wide faces, okay? So that uh, when we have our twisted ribbons, the necks are vertical with respect to the plane that we're looking at right now, and the faces are more horizontal, okay? So that we have that alternation of regions that want to bend preferentially in different ways. So we rely heavily on a numerical model that we did in Abacus. Um, what we did was to uh, basically take the ribbon, apply a pre-stretch, uh, so that's the first step in the deformation. Then we do this twisting. And this twist twisting is actually done uh, with an explicit solver, so like, kind of like a dynamic simulation. Um, and we apply mass scaling, which is basically artificially changing the uh, density of the material so that we speed up computation, computations. Um, of course, we try to be careful about it and to track, we try to track the uh, kinetic energy and always make sure 
that it doesn't exceed 5% of the total energy in the simulation. So that at least we make sure that there is no um, funky things uh, related to dynamics. So these are the parameters we selected and we will choose ribbons with different uh, numbers of mix. Now regarding the experiments, this is what we have. So we uh, start from a both metallic glass roll. Uh, this is pan melt. Uh, and because of the spin melting process used to fabricate this roll, uh, there, is, there are imperfections in the cross-section, as you can see over here. So we actually measured the cross-section to be 54 micrometers, which is smaller than the nominal one of 60. We then manually cut ribbons, and uh, we perform two types of experiments. First of all, we test the material itself uh, with, through tensile tests and digital image correlation. And second, we perform twisting experiments to compare to the numerics. So um, in particular, these are the material properties. Uh, the interesting one is the uh, elastic limit is around 2%. Perfect. So uh, let's look at some numerical results. So what you see over here is uh, a straight ribbon uh, simulated before and after applying a 3 pi twist. OK, so what you can see is that, well, in this deformed configuration, the darker colors correspond to larger strains. So we're actually plotting strains, not stresses. And uh, uh, by inspecting the shape, we can see that the larger strains typically happen at the edge of the uh, ribbon. And uh, uh, even because at the center of the ribbon, since we apply the free stretch, we really don't have those compressive stresses that could be dangerous for bucket. Okay, so we just consider the boundary point as the most dangerous. Uh, okay, so what we do is to plot the uh, logarithmic uh, strain as a function of theta, so the applied uh, twisting angle. So let's see the characteristics of these plots. So basically, we're plotting the maximum principal strain, the axial strain, which is as pedix 1, 1, and the uh, lateral strain, which is sub as subscript 2, 2. So you can see that the maximum principal and the axial strains coincide with each other. And in particular, they start from a non-zero number because of pre-stretch, okay? On the other end, the lateral stresses can be compressive, as you can see. And in fact, they increase quite dramatically. In particular, what you can have is that at a certain point, the stresses are so large that you have self-folding of the ribbon. So I'm not super sure about this, but according to Chopin and co-workers, at least they claim that the self-folding is actually an, unsta an unstable um, uh, type of deformation mechanism. So we actually have self-folding, as you can see also here in the simulation. You see it's not a perfect helicoid because it did self-fold. Um, and uh, we're, not, we're, we're able only to arrive at an angle of more or less 2 pi. So I didn't report any numerical results after that because I didn't, we didn't quite tailor the contact parameters in Abacus, so we didn't think it was proper to actually plot the rest of the simulation. Now we compare this to a case, an undulated ribbon, like the one that you see over here where um, uh, basically this is what we obtain after the formation, okay? So you see that after twisting it of three pi, we have that all the necks are parallel to each other and all the wide faces are parallel. Look at the strains increase with a much lesser rate with respect to the straight ribbon. So this is good for us. Um, and actually, we are monitoring the strains at the most critical point, which is the uh, edge of the thinnest region of the ribbon. And in this case, we were able to successfully reach the uh, target angle, uh, theta t equal to 3 pi. Okay? So even in this case, you can see that there are compressive lateral stresses, but their increase is much slower with respect to the uh, straight ribbon. So now what we do is to actually use this model uh, for the undulated ribbons and try to test a bit what is the influence of the various parameters. So what we have is that uh, uh, the, so let me move this. So what we can see is that uh, this is a maximum principal strain as a function of the number of necks. Um, and we can see that increasing the number of necks, we increase the maximum principal strain that we achieve. And in particular, for number of some max more uh, greater than equal than four, we have uh, that we exceed the elastic limit. Okay, so that's not something that we want. And we know that our material after exceeding the elastic limit pretty much breaks. Um, we also tried the, uh, to, to change the undulation amplitude. And what you can see over here is by decreasing the undulation amplitude, so towards the right, we uh, increase the maximum principal strain. 
And uh, in particular, we have that uh, as we increase the, the uh, we, as we decrease the undulation amplitude and the ribbon becomes more like very similar to the straight one, we also have self folding. So for this configuration of it. So based on this analysis, for the rest of the presentation, we decided to go ahead with three necks and a uh, certain width of W divided by six, a certain undulation amplitude of W divided by six. Okay, so for these uh, uh, properties, what we did, we tried to do uh, to compare numerics and experiments. So what you see over here is uh, the plot of the reaction force because that's what we can measure experimentally. So the reaction axial force in response to twisting as a function of the applied angle. And what you can see is that uh, basically, uh, there is, so there is no feeding required because we actually measure our, uh, our material parameters um, independently. Uh, and uh, despite that, there is excellent agreement between numerics and experiments, which tell us that uh, um, at least we, uh, we think we did a good job with those simulations. And in particular, here, the gray curves are the experiments with the standard deviation and the dashed curves are the numerics. Um, as predicted, for even for the experiments, if the number of neck is greater or equal than four, then you have breaking uh, before reaching the target angle. Okay, so let's move to the thermocoil. So now what we did was to uh, take a ribbon with those parameters that we selected, we cut it, uh, we pre-stretch it with a custom apparatus, we twist it, and then we uh, heat it up above its glass transition temperature. Uh, this is done by immersing it in a molten salt bath. And then we quench it in water. And what we will obtain in the end is a stress-free twisted ribbon. So this is, a, this is our fabrication apparatus. It's quite rustic. And yet we have these hot plates here at the bottom and our dynaline salt bath over here. So this is an original ribbon. And uh, upon twisting it and thermoforming it, you obtain a, a twisted one, for example, like the one that I have here in my hands. Um, and it's quite nice, so it's, uh, the, it's virtually stress-free. And what we obtain is uh, basically what we wanted in the beginning, which is a beam, a structural element of some sort, with multiple preferential bending axes, okay? Because all these thin necks uh, are parallel to each other and can bend about the X3 plane, as you can see over here. While the uh, wide faces are all parallel to each other and can bend about X2. We also did some numerics on this, on this bending process to make sure that we were not exceeding the uh, elastic limit of the material. And what you see over here is the bending behavior of one of the uh, thin nets, okay? So uh, we take a smaller region of the, of the ribbon and we bend it. Here we're plotting uh, the maximum principal strain versus D, which is basically a function of the bending angle. And uh, we can see that the strains do not exceed the 2% limit uh, that we uh, imposed. Uh, we also measured the moments given by these hinges. And I can tell you that we're still very far from creating an hinge that is potentially applicable for aerospace applications and so on. In fact, the moments that are typically used in those cases are much larger, uh, two orders of magnitude larger than the moments we achieve here. But we think that maybe with proper scaling, we would be able to achieve something like that at larger scale. Okay, so we also, uh, oh, one interesting thing that you can see over here is that basically once you bend this hinge, this is actually not a perfect in plane hinge, okay? Because you take your hinge, you bend it, and there is actually, as you can see over here, an out of plane deformation of the hinge, which can be seen as a noisance or can be seen as something to potentially exploit in order to obtain more complex deformation patterns in plane and out of plane. In this case, you see the bending of the wide face about X2, as you can see uh, over here. And then also in this case, we don't exceed the elastic limit. Now to show you the potential of, for deployability of the systems, what we did was to take a ribbon, sequentially fold all the necks, and then as we did over here, and then in the end, fold everything about the uh, wide face and obtain this very small deformed configuration. So now please note that uh, we use tape to keep this ribbon into its deformed shape, otherwise we just bring back to the initial configuration. Now with this idea in mind, we try to uh, show some potential for creating Morton structures with the systems. Here we want to create an auxetic structure, so with negative Poisson's ratio for now just in plane. Um, so we managed to create it, and here basically these red dots correspond to points where we put some um, 
tape in order to keep the joints together and show what the deformed pattern looks like. And you can see that it does have negative transmission. Now, the cool thing is that if you remove some of these joints, you have an outer plane bending of the overall structure, so which is, we think is something quite interesting. Uh, we also try to create a collapsible ring, like this one, that compresses into something much smaller. And finally, a twist collapse sphere that when compressed and slightly twisted, it can you know, like be compressed into this much smaller configuration. And this is actually, uh, when I saw it, it locally reminded me of a Hoberman toy, and yet another one. This is called the Hoberman Twist O, and it's basically this, this structure that, uh, pin drive the structure that you compress and twist, and it collapses. Nice, so especially uh, when dealing with, you saw this, this ribbon, so they're very complicated. So they, especially, you see the morphing patterns are extremely complex. So especially when dealing with complex morphing patterns, it's actually, it could be advantages if we didn't have to manually deform the structures, but if we could use some external stimulus in order to do the work. So uh, I'm not claiming that we were able to uh, morph the ribbons due to temperature, but what we did was to start looking at how we can use thermal expansion in order to create shape morphing structures due to temperature stimuli for very, for much simpler structures. So uh, the idea of morphing systems uh, in response to temperature is actually very old. Uh, and here I have an example of a technology that's quite used in spacecrafts. So these are actually louver systems. Um, louvers, uh, basically they are these uh, things that open and close, um, and they're connected in this case to a bimetal spring. So it's made of two different metals on top of each other that have different coefficients of thermal expansion. So when the temperature increases, what happens is one of the two materials expands more than others, and the spring unravels. When the spring unravels, the louvers open and they let the heat inside the spacecraft radiate out. Okay, so it's a quite old idea. And this idea of bimorphs or um, uh, multimorph um, laminas uh, has been used quite extensively also and pioneered, for example, in the context of morphing facades of buildings in order to create, for example, facades that can uh, um, uh, open up or close in response to temperature or humid stimuli for the thermal regulation of buildings. But what is the most complex thing that can be obtained in terms of environmental, environment triggered morphing? Um, this is actually a, a work that was done recently by the group of Jennifer Lewis at Harvard. They created multi-material lattices out of polymers that uh, in response to a temperature change, can morph into very complex surfaces. Okay, so this is state of the art as of now. What we wanted to do on the other end is to create something that is structural, so a system that has some structural capacity, has a low part count, so with compliant hinges, thermally actuated and made out of metal. Okay. And uh, um, again, the reason for this was because we were interested in doing metal structures with JPM. So this is our basic unit. What you see over here is basically a mechanism that features two components. One of them, and actually I also have it in my hands. Uh, one of them is a, um, a low CTE bar. So there is this dark region at the center, it's a bar, and there's a low coefficient of thermal expansion. In our case, it's made of titanium with a coefficient of thermal expansion of 8.6 or something um, micro strains per degree Celsius. So this thing, very small. The outer frame is made of aluminum, and it's made of different parts. We have some bulky beams that are connected by flexible joints. What we have is that uh, um, uh, basically when temperature increases, the uh, low CTE bar expands, so the two parts are jointed together, okay? We assume that there is perfect bonding between aluminum and titanium. When, once the uh, titanium, the low CTE bar expands, uh, the, the, the ICT part wants to expand even more but it cannot expand in the lateral direction because it's constrained by the low CTE bar. And because of that, we have an out of plane uh, deformation of the structure, as you can see over here. So we are able to increase the size of the structure in the vertical direction by a lot. Um, this was inspired by uh, other works that have been done in the context of these composites with extreme thermal expansion, and also by mechanisms that were introduced in other contexts, for example, in the context of vibration control. So let's look at some mechanics. What you see over here are numerical simulations done again with abacus on these structures. 
And here, what we plot is the vertical displacement UI of one of these units as a function of delta t. And here is the horizontal displacement as a function of delta t. What you can see is that the horizontal displacement, displacement is very small. It corresponds to really very small strains, micro strains, while the strains along the vertical direction are actually macroscopic. And in fact, you can see that for 100 degrees Celsius, you have a deformation of more or less, you have a displacement of more or less uh, um, seven millimeters, which is comparable to the size of the specimen. So we actually almost double the height of one of these cells in response to temperature. We wanted to understand more what's going on with the systems and we, we wanted to develop a uh, easy to use model or easy to understand model. Um, typically these models, these systems are uh, modeled with kinematics, just pure kinematics, where basically uh, this is a quarter of the cell uh, that we, we built. And basically what people typically assume is that, okay, there is an expansion of the low CTE bar um, and there is going to be also an expansion of the ICT bar, which is going to be large because it has a larger coefficient of thermal expansion. However, the big assumption here is that the horizontal displacement is only due, and you can see from this animation, the horizontal displacement is only due to the low CTE bar. Okay, so they assume that the low CTE bar expands. Yes, Manas? Okay, yeah, perfect. The low CTE bar expands and the ICT bar will also expand, but only rotate and create this vertical displacement, as you can see over here. However, looking, comparing it to our um, uh, numerics, you can see that the results are not that great. And the reason for this is because it uh, misses a very important point, which is the following. So when the low CTE bar, and I will try to explain it to you without looking at the graph. So what, what, what happens is that the uh, ICTE frame actually wants to expand of a certain quantity, which is larger than the expansion of the low CTE bar. So if you consider them as standalone elements, once you put them together, what happens is that there will be uh, the ICTE part will actually pull on the low CTE bar and cause some additional axial expansion that is not captured by the kinematics model. So what we tried to do was to create a model that captures that. Okay? And I will not go into detail. All we did was basically to try to figure out what is the force exerted by the expanding ICTE frame on the low CTE bar. Uh, then do a balance of forces at the joints between low CT and ICT material and determine what is this additional elongation. And then use this additional elongation in a to determine the outer plane, the uh, vertical deformation. We did that. And despite the fact that uh, the horizontal displacement, as you can see from the red lines down here, despite the fact that the horizontal displacement, it's still a little bit off you can see that now we can capture much better the vertical displacement of the cell. And uh, in particular, uh, you can see that uh, this actually, this model allows to capture this double inflection of the response. Okay, so we can use this model to actually span the parameter space of the systems in order to understand what are the best design parameters. And we did that both in terms of material and in terms of geometry. So in the interest of time, please, if you're interested, ask me about this later, um, uh, and I can tell you what were the things that we learned. But let's move to the experiments. We, fabrica we fabricated these structures out of titanium and aluminum. We slightly changed the design so that basically there is a puzzle-like joints um, that allows better um, bonding between the two materials, and we used glue, okay? Um, so what we did, these are thermomechanical setup. We have a hot plate. On top, we have our structure. We have a thermal camera that uh, allows us to both look at the temperature and kind of measure what is the uh, elongation of the structure. And we do that by pixel counting. Um, and here you see a plot where basically, so we did that experiment sort of on a 10 unit array, but we divided the response by 10 and compared it to the expansion of a single unit. And here you see the expansion of a single unit as a function of delta t. For numerics, uh, the, the dashed, the model, the red curve, and the experiments, the green dots. And you can see that the experiments matches uh, pretty well. Um, and also, we, we like the fact that it tracks this change of inflection of the curve. Um, we try to build 3D structures out of these uh, arrays. Uh, the interesting thing here is that we put together three arrays with a triangular footprint that is slightly different from each other. And you can tell because there is not only an extension, but also a slight bend 
it actually, it actually, which actually tells us that we can use these non-homogeneities to create systems that uh, have more complex deformation patterns. We also uh, applied this idea to the lunar temperature range, so the temperature range that is up there on the moon. On the moon, during the night, you have temperatures of minus 170 Celsius, during the day, 130. So we wanted to create structures that can exploit this large temperature range without uh, plastically deforming. Um, and we did that by creating this initially deformed structure, uh, starting from our unit, and then uh, testing numerically uh, what could happen. And we think that the applicability of the structures, for example, to create passive uh, actuation systems for uh, lunar structures is actually uh, quite interesting. Uh, there are problems, of course. For example, we didn't look at fatigue deformation. If there are cycles day and night, I'm pretty sure this would be a problem. So in the last two minutes, and I promise it's two minutes, I just want to show you uh, our efforts in order to upscale uh, basically the strategy that we came up with at the beginning of this talk. Okay, I promised that we would go towards functional morphing structures that are potentially load bearing, and this is where we're moving. In particular, I will show you how we did it and what were the compromises that we had to make. So let's remember what we saw in the beginning of the presentation. We have a, a starting grid. For each grid, we prescribe a diamond-shaped cut, which can be according to a periodic pattern like you see over here. Now, for each tile, we replace the tile with this uh, uh, truss-like analog, which is this X-shaped truss, which basically has a hole corresponding to the hinge. Okay? So we can fabricate all these elements in series, by via laser cutting, we can join them together and create this uh, truss analog of our initial rubber sheet. We can actually create these truss analogs on much larger scales, like you can see over here. This is a three meter by three meter structure done with that strategy. So the beauty is that the mechanics is the same. So even in this case, we have this frustration. So the central region wants to expand more than the sides. Uh, we pull on it, and once we pull on it, basically this central region will buckle out of plane. It takes two people to do that. It takes a third person to actually do something that we think is very interesting. So there are some free trusses at the edges. If you pull them together and join them together with an additional uh, with additional joints, you're able to obtain a structure that is actually self-standing and it's pretty stressed because of this bending. It's bent, okay? So it's a bending active structures, uh, structure as they call it in uh, civil engineering. Now, the cool things about the structure is that it's deployed via tensile forces and compressive forces. To the best of my knowledge, there is only another group at the PFL that has, has pioneered this idea of tensile pooling to have shape morphing of grid shell like structures. Um, typically, in fact, the grid shells, which are these large, lightweight domes, are created by means of compressive forces. And that can be a problem because if you have compressive forces, you can have actually weird buckling modes. Uh, in our case, the, uh, the formation is guided by non periodicity so we don't have anything at this point. And if we pin the boundary, we guarantee a pre-stressed dome, which we think is actually structurally very interesting. Okay, so this concludes my talk. Um, this is the outline of what I showed you today. Uh, just, uh, I would like to thank the people that made this possible. I didn't do this all by myself, not surprisingly. Uh, there are many people that had a great contribution, starting from my postdoc advisor, Chiara Daraglio, Dad Hoffman at Caltech, Basile, without whom these projects wouldn't have even started, and all the students that worked with me throughout the years, and that this contribution is, uh, was extremely valuable to obtain these results. With that, thank you for your patience, and uh, I would be super happy to take any questions. Thank you, Paolo. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, do we have any questions from the panel? Audience panel. Audience, okay. Filippo, of course. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> Hi, Paolo. Can you can you hear me? Yes, Filippo, I can. Okay. One talk I really appreciated. Uh, I had a couple of questions. I will start uh, with one that uh, brings us back to the beginning of your story. Yeah. Uh, in the, in the design process of these uh, out-of-plane sh elastic sheets, what I yes. don't understand is if the force that you apply comes first and then you design your, uh, your uh, diamond-shaped grid according to the force, 
or if instead you first design the grid and then you choose what, where to put the pins to get the, your desired out of plane effect. This is not so. so yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that's very, that's very, uh, that's a very uh, great point. So right now the way we did it, this was uh, via intuition. So basically, uh, in our mind, it was a an inverse design in my mind, but it wasn't an inverse design <laughs> actually, uh, because what we we, we try to think, how can we obtain, for example, that the dotted region pops up? What is needed? Like in this case, well, what we thought is like, okay, you need to obtain some sort of biaxial expansion surrounded by regions that don't want to biaxial expand. And then we try to see, you know, which forces would allow us to do this. So we're actually, uh, the thing is, it's a complicated problem. It involves geometry for the auto plane transformation, involves mechanics for the application of forces. Uh, we are not yet at the stage where we can uh, you know, predict things uh, or do things really in an inverse way. So from a cat pattern, determining the shape and forces. However, what's important is that the, um, uh, the, 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 the in-plane cat pattern and the forces that you need to apply go hand in hand. Like they both together allow you to obtain the shape that you want. Okay, uh, if, I, if I may just a very quick other question on slide 11, I think. You have this uh, very this cylindrical uh, structure that uh, basically expands it or, and contracts. Uh, how did you how did you connect uh, from a, a plane to something cylindrical? I don't see exactly yeah. the, uh, the yeah. connection. No, no, no. So the way we did it is uh, um, actually we super we designed it so that uh, at the edge there would be some um, trusses that would superimpose with each other, um, okay. and then we just basically glued them on top of each other to hold it up. Okay. So that's, yeah, 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 that's uh, no, no, magic, no magic there. It's actually... It's <laughs> no, the, the picture looks really nice. So I, I wanted to be sure, actually. Oh, no, this is done. Uh, I, I wish it wasn't, but it was actually done with, uh, <laughs> with double-sided tape and glue. Okay. So thank you very much again, Paolo. Yeah, no problem, Filippo. Thanks for the questions. Paolo, we have a question in the Q&A section. If you... Yeah. So it's from Guillaume Cohen. What kind of metallic BMG do you use? Uh, say it again. What what kind of uh, bulk metallic glass do you use? Hmm. Yes. So um, this is actually it, it's not my area of expertise. So this is actually our colleagues at JPL. They're the ones that pick the alloy. So the one that we're using is this. Uh, I, I wouldn't even the, the one that I'm lighting right now on this slide. So it's a it's a zirconium uh, based. Um, I, I think. Like our colleagues at JPL, especially Doug Hoffman, has been doing like all his life. He has been doing uh, both metallic glasses. And this is uh, actually an alloy that uh, it's pretty good. And uh, he was able to find a manufacturer for it. So that's the one we picked uh, for this reason. But I have a question here. So yeah. where do you draw the line between a bulk metallic glass and a high entropy alloy? Um, uh, because the composition here is, okay, I see that one is, one is significantly high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, this is, uh, Manas, I, I, I really apologize, but this is like- No, it's okay, it's my, a very nice question as well, so I don't know. Maybe. But this is not my thing. Uh, the, the thing is, um, for us, we just, uh, we didn't develop the material, of course, um, but we really appreciated the properties, uh, especially okay. the thermoplastic forming, which is something that, uh, allows to obtain these complex shapes that otherwise wouldn't be unattainable. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Basil, you have a question? Yeah, so I, I like the, the idea of uh, twisting the ribbon and using that joint. So just to make sure I understand, you, uh, you end up using a design where the thin parts are all perpendicular to each other, right? Yes. Yes. And and you, you do that because you want to have a, you know inches in three D that can fold in one direction and in the perpendicular direction. Exactly. Have you explored, so, have you explored different relative angles than ninety degrees? And uh, because you could imagine more complex yeah. unfolding. Uh, no, we didn't. Um, we, we did not. Uh, we, we 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 thought for this first work uh, that that was it. Uh, that was all we wanted to try. But there are several interesting things. Like for example. Um, yeah, you're saying one, for example, if you want to obtain more alternations, how would you be able to obtain it? My guess would be you would need a longer ribbon with a lot of necks 
because the next is actually where the formation concentrates. And then you don't twist it to its target angle, but you twist it to a fraction of that, um, so that you actually have some, some of them aligned in one direction, some of them aligned at 45 degrees maybe, and some of them aligned again. Um, but another interesting thing that we were thinking about is like, okay, what if you have a non-periodic uh, non undulation? You know, that you have something which has, for example, a gradient. In that case, if you twist it, what's, what's going to happen? Can you, yeah, you could design, You could design each inch, uh, you know, in space with a, by... With a different thickness also, so, so that right. maybe the, it concentrates more or less deformation. Okay. Um, it, the design space for the systems is infinite. Uh, it's, honestly, it's a little daunting, and this is just the beginning. I mean, at least to my knowledge, nobody tried to do uh, this banning thing. And by the way, the, 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 the enfolding kinematics is quite tricky. I'm not sure I got all the story from the pictures. It might be nice to see a movie. Mm -hmm. You mean for the, yes, I, I agree with you. Uh, the, yeah, uh, unfortunately, I do not have the movie, but I agree with you. We should probably make that. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> Very nice talk. Thanks for the suggestion. Sebastian had his hand up, but I guess he put it down. Uh, yes, I there? think it's, it's like the same question. I was wondering whether you have uh, tried uh, you, you seems to have used n capital n equal three, yes. and I had the question about other uh, value of capital n, yeah. and it seems that Basil asked the, the the fact that in the in the previous slide uh, number fifteen, mm -hmm. you have to, in fact you have two n, you have the periodicity and the twisting n, you you have this n and this it could be n one and n two and you could. Yes. Uh, that could okay. be different. Okay. Yeah, 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 that Thank could you. be different. Um, and the, the thing is, regarding the influence of N, um, this, is, this, is a, this is the, the best yeah, we did okay. at the point. Yeah. Mm. Um, basically, just trying to check. So if you have a, a certain finite length of your ribbon, and you yeah. twist it of a certain angle, uh, so and you change the number of necks, it turns out if that if you have too many necks, then mm. you're not going to be able to reach that angle that allows you to have this alternation of ribbons. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. it's just the stresses are too high. But uh, yeah, uh, thanks for that question. Thank you. Actually, I, I, uh, to ask, it was along these lines actually, it's a part now. Um, so uh, very nice um, idea of this twisting thing. Now I have like a double question on that. So I mean, mm -hmm. I guess you're twisting and then you're relaxing the pre-stresses. Yes. <laughs> so now the first question is, uh, uh, if you don't relax the pre-stresses, you could, if, if it is possible, then you could have a, a self-deploying uh, yeah. self structure. If it's constrained, then you, you let it allow. Then you can design like inversely the, the same thing, right? With, without putting an external force. It is yeah. stored, it is stored in the pre-stressing of the, of the ribbons. Mm -hmm. I guess using a number of numerical tools, you can uh, in general design something simple, then going to more complex, I don't know, okay? You need uh, and then the, my second question is, I mean, if you, use, if you, if you, if you twist this thing, then uh, there is some kind of uh, chirality. I'm not yes. sure if the chirality is, is, remains in the system, if it you does. unload it, if you take the pre-stresses out or not, but there is some chirality. So you can also play, can you play also with uh, having opposite chiralities and mm -hmm. having, actually you can go to extremely complex shapes, but the, but the, 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 the the question is, how do you do it in a more um, uh, rational way? Rational way, because, because the, the complexity here is, uh, is, huge. Is, is huge. So yeah. is there a way that you can uh, reduce uh, somehow or the, the design space? Or have you thought, uh, or maybe a simpler problem or where mm -hmm. to start? Because these are nonlinear phenomena. So I don't yeah. know if optimization in the standard sense can do anything. So is, is there a way or? Okay, so thanks for the both questions, very good. Um, okay, so regarding the first one uh, for the, for the pre-stress, the reason why we didn't try to use the pre-stress is because um, if, we, if you twist a ribbon, then it's like very, very hard to tame in a way. So you can't really, like if you wanted to assemble something, you know, with a pre-twisted pre -twisted ribbons, it would be a nightmare. So now an idea, could be to add something with, uh, um, if you use, we didn't, so this both metallic glass don't have shape memory effect. But if you use something with shape memory effect, you're able to twist the ribbon, and then all of a sudden you 
like you know, change the temperature or something, and you resort to the original configuration, thereby relieving that uh, you know, like one forcing the structure to more. Then I think you can obtain something that is self-folding, uh, and you could potentially leverage all these nice mechanics that you get with this. Does that make sense? I I just thought about it now. Oh, yes, that, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it could it could be a different material and different actuators. Yeah. You have already mentioned a number of actuation methods. I mean, this goes. This is the, the kinematics, as, as you said. Um, yeah, but I think that's, that's a very interesting point. Uh, we, we, we did think about it, but we thought, you know what, like we, we're not going to be able to do this at the moment. Let's start from something where we can really, you know, freeze it into the shape and start to understand the mechanics. So that brings me to the second question, which is uh, how can we actually uh, try to make a sense out of this problem? So this is something that uh, I'm still thinking about nowadays. So I think maybe one way. So there is a chirality. So you, you are completely right, because if you take your, the ribbon, you twist it in one direction or you twist it in the other direction, like when you do your thermoforming, then you have ribbons that are basically either helicoids in one direction or helicoids in the other. And then when you assemble them together into structures, now all the, all the, all the, all the structures that you have seen that were made with ribbons having the same chirality, but they actually made some ribbons with the opposite chirality. And we could put them together to obtain even more complex deformation patterns. Okay. So now this brings me to the last part, which is how do we make sense out of this? Well, I'm not 100% sure yet. However, I think that uh, um, one thing is that, so if you, if you take one of these hinges and you try to bend it, there is going to be this out of plane of shooting of the hinge. So basically, uh, let me check. So the hinge doesn't deform in plane. It kind of does something like this. There is an out of plane deformation of the hinge. So what you could do is to think that at those points, so you can represent those hinges as uh, points where only a certain rotation with a certain angle is allowed. So you see what I mean? It's a kind of replacing the continuous system with a, um, a discrete system that has these joints that are not planar joints, but they can, be, they can follow the, uh, the, the mechanics of the twisting. Um, Hinge, okay. if, if that makes any sense. To, because I, I don't see any other way of rationalizing. It is a, a curiosity question because, I mean, uh, there is a lot of work now on, uh, from different points of view on this kind of. And, uh, and then uh, the, the, the point that is uh, using this mechanism by default, uh, you're, you're, you're working with nonlinear systems. So there is a nonlinearity here. And it's not very easy to say I'm optimizing something. No, uh, you're right. You're right. Or, no, or no, no. something in a. In a, in a more so, uh, the, the question is how somebody at, in this nonlinear regime somebody can uh, can have something that is more uh, tangible and easy by design. Like I want to get that. How to invert the system? The inversion is not unique. No. So then how do you? How, is there a kind of data mining process? Or I don't know. So, then so I um, number of calculations and picking up. I don't know what's the way to go. It's like a curiosity question because the. I'm also yeah. into it a little bit. And, uh, so that, even in my case, I, I, um, I would say I do not know yet. So once I get my first students, these are the first things that I would uh, like to start digging into. Um, I know that uh, so far, um, I think well, the, there are some inverse. Okay, so we weren't actually, it turns out that when we came up with this idea of non-periodic metamaterials and how to play morphing, other people were actually coming up with the same ideas. So these people are, uh, for example, are at the PFL, uh, computer scientists. So what they did, they were able to do an inverse problem, but it's a geometric inverse problem, where basically they just, you know, um, map a certain 3D uh, you know, shape into a main plane. Yeah, uh, I, I, know this, I know this work. Uh, I mean, as long as you stay in the geometry space, Yes. Then, and you have exactly. a linear system, then you can invert things. The, the thing is, when you go to uh, some kind of instability, post-instability response, then I, 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 don't, I don't think any of this, because the post-instability response is, you cannot invert the system uniquely. You have multiple, you might have other... You, you, this, you can discuss with um, Paolo later. Uh, okay. Okay. okay, sounds good. You know, yeah, we can take one last question from Andre. Thanks a lot for the talk. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Paolo, for the... the the presentation. So my question was the following. So it looks like the twisting is technology driven because of your manufacturing. Yeah. But 
we could expect, for example, to use a thermoplastic uh, ribbon, and then you could go in temperature, shape your stuff, and then come down and you have the same ribbon. So finally, yes. I think your idea initially, when you said I have some nodes where I can, which work like hinges with respect to a certain direction, and then I have bending with respect to another direction, this would be the two elements of your Lego. So yes. are you able to design a structure starting from just these two elements and ideas? Um, not yet, <laughs> but uh, potentially yes. So actually I have to, I have to um, uh, correct something. So this was actually not technology driven. So we thought it turned out that, uh, we, so we wanted to do these ribbons regardless in order to have the alternation of bending regions. And then we, uh, talking to our colleagues at JPL, they were like, you know, actually both metallic glass is thermoplastically formable, you can do it with that. But before um, then, I, I, we were thinking about completely, I, actually I was thinking of taking a plastic material and manually forming it, okay. to create this change of bending angle. Um, so, but as far as uh, really taking those, you know, those fundamental uh, behaviors of the hinges and building structures out of it, I haven't done, we haven't done it yet. Um, so this is uh, this, this work is super fresh. I think we finished writing it like less than a month ago. So um, in the future, I'm, I'm really looking forward to exploring more, you know, this, this uh, interesting mechanics that the system has and uh, that we, we, we encountered quite serendipitously, honestly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Andre. Okay, um, I guess, oh, there is one more. Oh, no, it's Andre's hand. Still up. I, maybe I can ask a quick uh, application question. So you, you yes. discussed about the lunar uh, yes. daylight models. Uh, when the temperature increases and decreases, what kind of application are you looking over there? And yeah. why would it be important to... Mm -hmm. Is it an actuation? Is it... Is it a... It's a, it's a, it can be many things. Um, so the thing is... Uh, um, and this is the this is the, the the spiel that my colleague at JPL gave me. Okay, so that's why how he convinced me that this was um, useful. So first of all, what you can do is to create some um, switches that you know can propagate uh, you know a certain that can you know connect two electrical components during the day and uh, shut them off at night. You know that can be a first thing. Or for example, connect a solar panel to a battery during the day and disconnect it at night in order to avoid weird things happening to the battery. Um, the other thing is if we were able to obtain more complex shapes, so right now I'm just able to create, we are just able to create these uh, um, systems that expand in one direction. However, if we're able to create something that, for example, bends, folds, twists, then we might be able also to create a deployable panel, like a solar panel that simply during the day deploys, opens up, and during the night, it kind of closes up in order to protect it potentially also from the, uh, uh, the, the temperatures. Um, this is just some, some ideas. Another idea could be you could use passive systems of this type for thermal regulation of spacecrafts as well. So mm -hmm. instead of using those louvers that still have many components, you can think of creating a skin or a metallic skin for your um, uh, spacecraft that when the temperature increases, Inside, it just opens up, and due to these openings, it lets the heat radiate out as well. Um, okay. So, yeah. so, so on that on that note, actually, we have a question in the Q and A: Is will these thermal? Is it possible to have these thermal deformations to be irreversible uh, after heating and cooling? And can the structure eventually keep its deformed state? Because I would expect there is some form of um, ratcheting or something that could happen. Yeah. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. ratcheting, and what, what I would love to explore for this, and I, it's, still, it's still in my mind, I haven't started yet, but if you can use, for example, some sort of bistable design that is triggered due to uh, temperature, and then you just, you know, like with a, with a small thermal deformation or maybe large, you are able to um, just uh, have the system shift to the second stable state, um, mm -hmm. and therefore keep it in that. See, but ratcheting is probably what would be the simplest one. It wasn't my. It wasn't the first thing I thought about. I first thought about buckling, but um, or a uh, water stability more than buckling. Okay. okay, and this so this there in on the on the moon you would not use bulk metallic glasses, right? You would expect to use. 
metals? Um, no, I, I would I would want to pick two metals that uh, um, really have dissimilar coefficients of thermal expansion, whatever they are. Um, we, we tried titanium aluminum because they're widely used. You can do invar, you can use invar as a low CPE material because it, it has very low CPE, so you can obtain larger deformations if you couple it, for example, to aluminum. Um, so there are many, uh, many potential combinations. But I would, uh, so both metallic glass can be used for space applications. Um, like our colleagues at JPL have tried to like, advertise that for years and years. So you can create some components out of them. Um, but um, it doesn't specifically apply to this. Okay, Sebastian, maybe you can ask the last yeah, question. Yeah, a, a quick one. The, the, the day on the moon is lasting very long, I guess. Mm. It's not 24 hours. How long is it? Is it? Is it? Okay, wait, I'm, I'm not super. This, this I'm not super it's sure It's like about. A, half a month, I would say. The, the moon is taking a month to orbit around Earth. And I, so I would, I would think the day is like 15 days. You have light for 15 days. Oh, yeah. yeah no, actually, and, that, and, uh, that actually makes sense now that you say it. So the, cycle, the number of cycles might not be as high as I thought, Yeah. Um, which is actually potentially good for, for fatigue, if anything. Um, but no, thanks for that. Actually, you know, I was so immersed into the day-night idea that I never really processed the fact that, yeah, it's, it's a different, it's a different yes, duration. duration. Yes, Yeah. No, thanks okay. for that, Sebastian. Thank you for your talk. Yeah, thanks, thanks for listening. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. See Bye -bye. you. Bye. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, Paolo. Yeah. Ciao. Thank you.